Silver, to me, is the buying opportunity of a generation. And I say that with 100% sincerity and objectivity. Buy the dips. Don't chase the rips. Buy the dips. Please join us for our next live stream Sunday, April 4th at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go over current events, past guests, and, of course, gold and silver news. Once again, our next live stream will be Sunday, April 4th. 9 p.m. Eastern. See you then. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. As always, if you are new to our channel or if you haven't already done so, please do subscribe, hit the bell to be notified of new updates, and give us a thumbs up if you like what we do. We truly do appreciate your support. Thank you for it. Our guest today is Andy Sheckman, President and CEO of Miles Franklin Precious Metals Investments. The company has eclipsed $6 billion in sales of a wide variety of bullion and numismatic products. And Andy believes that fair pricing and extensive client education and support must go hand in hand. And prior to starting Miles Franklin Limited in 1989, Andy was a licensed financial planner specializing in Swiss franc investments and alternative investments. And we're delighted to have Andy here today on SBTV as our first time guest. It's time to saddle up and silver up for Andy Sheckman. Andy, welcome to SBTV. How are you doing? Good to see you, Patrick. Thanks for having me, buddy. I'm well, thank you. Great, great to have you on. It's always nice to have a friend on the program and appreciate the time that, you, that you've given. Um, Likewise. Andy, thanks. Andy, understand that Miles Franklin Precious Metals Investments was started by you and your father, David Sheckman. Can you share with us how David and yourself founded the company and why, why precious metals? Sure. So my dad's middle name is Miles and his best friend who loaned us $60,000 in 1989 on a wing and a prayer to start a company. His middle name was Franklin. Uh, our initial mission was to uh, help people find their way into Swiss investments. We were a representative and still are to an extent of a company called BFI Consulting out of Zurich. And uh, very quickly, we realized that the same person who bought Swiss francs bought precious metals. My father uh, was a representative of a company here in Minneapolis called Investment Rarities for a long time and was speaking on behalf of um, uh, uh, Investment Rarities in uh, Zurich when he was approached by some gentlemen to uh, bring Swiss investments to the United States. And that was 1989, really the... The rest is history. Precious Metals was a uh, natural fit for the hard asset minded investor who was looking to find their way into Swiss denominated uh, instruments. And uh, it just became like a hand in glove. Uh, that was your non-denominated, non-dollar denominated investments offshore. And the gold would have been your non-dollar denominated investments at home. And uh, to this day, you'll find people who are interested in, in currencies like Swiss francs, also probably own precious metals. And uh, we are somewhat, Patrick, the embodiment of the American dream. When we started our company in 1989, um, my father uh, sold his life insurance policies, my parents, uh, and we borrowed the money, $60,000 from his best friend, whose middle name was Franklin, uh, to start the company on a wing and a prayer in a one room office. And here we are 31 years later, eclipsing six billion in sales without a customer complaint, maintaining an A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau. We're one of only 27 US Mint authorized resellers. Our reputation is something I'm most proud of because literally uh, since I was 19 years old, this has been my labor of love. And uh, my father is retired, but still my partner. And um, our main focus, although still help people with Swiss investments is precious metals and um, I have looked at it for the last 31 years, not as investments, but as wealth. To me, gold and silver, if I could encapsulate our mentality at Miles Franklin and why precious metals, it's wealth to me. It's been wealth for 5,000 years. And when I started the company with my father as a 19-year-old, he said to me, Andy, there'll be one rule and only one rule. And if you violate that one rule, I'll fire you. Okay, dad, what's that one rule? He says, you'll buy something every two weeks, period. And that's it when you get paid. Okay, dad, I can deal with that. So here we are 31 years later, Patrick, and honoring the why gold. This is the reason why. For 31 years, every two weeks, I have bought something, gold or silver, something, or platinum or palladium, whatever. 
And I look back over those 31 years, and even though I own the company and been the president, my dad's retired, he's not going to fire me any longer. I've honored my word to him. And for every two weeks, for 31 years, I have never missed a, a, a buy, a, a purchase, ever. And to me, when I look back at over, look back over all of the, the um, stuff that I've accumulated, uh, it's not an investment to me. It's my wealth and wealth that I hope I never need to use. And if I do, I'm damn glad I have it. If not, I give it to my kids someday. So to me, that's what precious metals is. And, and the why precious metals, that's why. It's, it's wealth. And I go to bed at night, although too late these days, uh, feeling really good about helping people uh, purchase wealth. And while some may look at it as an investment, to me, it's been wealth for 5,000 years, whether it be kings, queens, pharaohs, emperors, find it in the Bible. To me, it is really the best way to save, preserve, and pass on wealth uh, and has been really for, you know, a long, long time. So that's, that's the why part of it. And, well, the how part of it still kind of amazes me that I found my way here talking to you today from where the humble beginnings we started from. Yeah, I hear you completely agree with with a lot of what you said. And you mentioned something along the lines of not sleeping enough. How are things going at Miles Franklin? I mean, we, we've we seen the big surge in, in uh, demand and the tightening of supply. So how are things working out right now at Miles Franklin? Since February of 2020, and I, I'm not joking on this. I'm truly, truly being honest. Since last February, uh, and, you know, Thank goodness to that. Uh, we have been working 18, 20 hour days, 18 for sure, seven days a week. Uh, we are as busy as anything I could even try to explain to someone. Um, and it doesn't let up. And, you know, when you start a company in a one room office by selling your life insurance policies and borrowing $60,000 from a friend and having strong fingertips to hang on through the lean years, when you see something like this, I don't believe this market, even in the run-up to 1980, I don't think this market's experienced anything like this. Um, the level of demand is off the charts, and uh, it's a blessing. It's also when you say not sleeping, it's true, Patrick. I, um, I start my day at 6.37 in the morning. I go to bed at 2 in the morning just about every single night, no matter how hard I try to do otherwise. Uh, I'm personally getting between four and 600 emails a day, 100 plus phone calls a day, every day. And I'm just one person. I have uh, our brokers are doing the same thing and we're hiring more people. We're doing our best to keep up. And it's a blessing. I, I get it. It's also ex extraordinarily um, eye opening. And uh, what's interesting, Patrick, it, about this is that if, if you go back and draw a line, a timeline, we go back to 1980, that was the last time we saw the Dow and the price of gold cross at one to one. And back then, no one ever wanted Dow stocks. They wanted gold coins and silver dollars. And as we mitigate or, or migrate rather 40 years to the beginning of 2020, before COVID really showed itself, let's go December 2020. At that point, there was one half of 1% allocation uh, to US based investments in precious metals. In 1980, it was 8%. So from 8% in 1980 to one half of 1% 1 in 2020. And that's from Joe Sixpack on the street all the way up to the Harvard Endowment Fund and everything in between, one half of 1%. Now, in statistics, very often, the further away you get from long-term averages, the greater the magneticism that pulls you back to the mean. The mean over the 40 year period is two and one half percent. And I would argue since 2020, since COVID, we have begun to migrate to the mean. Maybe it's at 1% now, maybe it's at one and a half percent. And when I say one or one and a half, I mean, if all of the investments in this, in this country were totaled, everyone has maybe 1% of their assets cumulatively uh, on average, invested in precious metals. Now, that 1% would be a double of anything the industry has ever seen. But what if we get to that mean of 2.5%? Maybe we're closer to that than I think. That's a five-fold increase in demand. And you're hearing all around the globe, um, you know, from ocean to ocean and everywhere in between, um, places are running out of bullion. 
I would argue, we are getting closer to that mean. And what happens if an awakening brings it to 10%? So of all of the assets people own, 10% in precious metals. Well, that's a 20-fold increase in what this industry has seen over the last you know, 40 years. So the recency bias would mean that we are in no means or no shape to handle that kind of influx of demand. And you're beginning to see that. And so as, as demand increases, uh, there are just a few places that can handle that demand. Miles Franklin being one of those places in the United States that helps people. And so if, if our lengthy hours of, of working is, has anything to do with an increase in demand and an expansion of that mean or that allocation to people's portfolios, I, I will tell you that we're getting close to maybe to that mean. We're heading to that two and a half percent because uh, it doesn't let up seven days a week. We get phone calls Saturday night, Sunday night, and we're old school, Patrick. We're not an online company, although we are talking about adding an online feature. We're building a really nice new website right now, uh, but we do things the old old fashioned way by phone call and, and by conversation, not by click. And um, so our people are calling us all hours of the night, seven days a week. So it's a blessing, no question about it, but it's also eye-opening. And, and yet most people in the United States wouldn't know a gold coin if it fell on their foot. When the awakening expands, kind of like what the Reddit group is doing right now, the Wall Street Reddit group is really expanding interest and understanding, um, you know, who knows what, what that'll bring. But we right now are at, at, at levels that I've never seen in 31 years. Okay, so you mentioned um, phone just doesn't stop ringing, emails constantly coming in. What do you say to clients who ask you if they should hold bullion or perhaps hold metals ETFs, precious metals ETFs, or if they should hold mining stocks? Well, I think that precious metals ETFs are, are the way to own gold and silver. In fact, take a look at GLD and SLV. I don't like them at all. And there's been a lot of shenanigans and, and talk centered around the ETFs, around GLD, around SLV, uh, the changing of the prospectus. If people who own GLD and SLV did nothing other than read pages six through 12 on the prospectus titled risk factors and really took the time to read it, maybe reread it uh, slowly, uh, they wouldn't own any. I find it to be one of the most nefarious products ever made, uh, GLD and SLV, on many levels. Um, as far as mining shares, I think everyone should own some. I think that if we view our assets as a pyramid, the way that the Swiss have for 300 years, the base of your pyramid, which is the more expansive part, 60, 70% of your assets, would be things like precious metals, paid for real estate, cash in the bank, CDs, whatever. The top 10 or 20, excuse me, the, the middle 20% uh, percent of, of your pyramid would be things, I used to say treasuries, but with treasuries really offering a negative real yield, that doesn't fit in there. So maybe something like a utility stock uh, from a power company that throws off a dividend, throws off a little income, really not speculative, slightly more than the bottom, but but throwing off a little bit of income and the top 10% of your pyramid being the, these, the more speculative things like cryptocurrencies and mining shares. The theory behind it is that as long as the base of your pyramid is stable and solid and very low yielding growth, the middle portion uh, and the top portion as we go up higher and higher in speculation, if you lose everything on the top 10%, don't make anything on the middle 20%, as long as the base 30 or 70% of your pyramid is intact, you never go backwards. So yeah, I, I think that um, I think that people should own bullion as wealth and they should own mining shares as an investment. And in terms of the ETFs, I wouldn't own them with a 10 foot pole. Uh, the only one that I would own if I had no other choice would be the Sprott funds, PSLV, uh, PHYS as Eric Sprott and the Sprott Corporation is synonymous with integrity and honesty. Uh, and I do not feel that way even remotely about GLD and SLV. And uh, you don't have to go any further when we talk about who the administrators are of those two accounts. I mean, talk about the fox guarding the hen house. You got SLV administered by JP Morgan, who paid in 
$1,920 fine for manipulating the metals market, yet is still allowed to be the administrator of the largest silver trust in the world. And of course, maybe equally as, as corrupt and nefarious of a, of a commercial bank uh, running GLD is HSBC Bank. And when you talk about these two institutions that have paid billions of dollars in fines for market manipulation, HSBC for, for working with drug cartels, I mean, the whole nine yards, it's gross, but the ETFs are a tool of manipulation for the commercial banks. You look at, at SLV as an example. Uh, on Feb, in February, when the world is going nuts, right? Um, all of the online companies are shut down that weekend because you know on Friday when the market goes to sleep here in Minnesota at five o'clock roughly, it, it sleeps over the weekend till Sunday at five o'clock. And during that period, it's the only time in the whole week when the market sleeps. Otherwise, it's open as it travels around the globe. On a Friday night, typically what we will do is we will go long into the weekend. Um, and that particular Friday night, the first, I think it was, uh, or maybe something like that, February 1st or March 30th or, or um, January 31st, something around there, uh, we bought 11 contracts of silver going into the Friday night close which would have been 55,000 ounces. So that the theory is I can sell silver um, over the weekend and I'm hedged, right? So, and, and oftentimes my head trader will ask me what I expect for the weekend. Do I have interviews? Do we, should we go extra long or what? So that weekend we went 55,000 ounces long on a Friday close. By Saturday morning, well, by Friday night, I noticed all the online companies in the United States shut down. I don't know if you folks shut down in Singapore that weekend, but we, we were noticing all of the big companies were shutting down. Now, we're not an online company, so we are a step behind that. And it was strange to me. I wondered at, at the moment if it was because maybe people were out of product because looking at the shelves, they all seemed empty. By Saturday morning at nine in the morning, my head trader called me. I was in Florida on a vacation, which I never left my house, the, the rental house that we were in ever, except to go buy a new property because I'm leaving Minnesota to move to Florida. That was the only time I left in 10 days. The rest of the time I was in working. This was the kind of demand. I mean, I'm working 20 hours a day on vacation and my whole family's out across the street at the beach. I can't leave the place. That's the kind of demand that was going on. And, and tons of demand is going into SLV and GLD. Tons, like the biggest ever, the most amount of ounces are going into the fund ever as we see on those two days. By Saturday morning, my head trader calls me and says, do you realize that last night we sold 90,000 ounces? You are 35,000 ounces exposed into the open. And by the way, all the online companies closed last night for this same reason. I said, lock it down. For the first time in 31 years, we shut down our trading. So in this environment where precious metals companies are shutting down, where more ounces are going into the ETFs than ever before, when the market could potentially gap open and we're already 35,000 ounces exposed. When it opened, we were able to hedge quickly, it still cost us $40,000. But where I'm going with this is this. So you have this massive influx into the ETFs, right? Um, and then the price gets slammed because some genius decides to dump one and a half years worth of global mine supply, uh, or nearly, excuse me, almost two years worth of global mine supply, one and a half billion ounces at the open. You're talking somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 plus billion dollars, $45 billion worth of silver dumped at the open in the access market in between the close of London and the open in New York. And as that happens, that guarantees the worst possible execution in real world would be fired and prosecuted and lucky if he wasn't shot. And so when that happens, you are guaranteeing the worst possible execution. You're freaking out the Reddit group. You're, you're doing this as a drive-by shooting for effect. So I'm going somewhere with this. So the price gets driven down, right? Over the last couple of weeks after that, 90 million ounces of silver were backdoored out of the SLV trust by the commercial banks. The only people who can pull metal out of these accounts are the authorized participants in enormous quantities. And these are the commercial banks that fund it. So look at the, look at the project or look at the, um, the path of this price goes way up to 30 bucks. All of this metal goes into SLV sold by the commercial banks. The price gets driven down artificially. And then the metal gets sucked out the back door 
at lower prices, four bucks less, three and a half bucks less, sucked out by the commercial banks at lower prices. And that's what they have the ability to do by share redemption. And, and it's almost impossible even to see who did it. So when you talk about GLD and SLV and the ETFs, to me, they are they are not the way to own precious metals. And they help the cartel, the precious metals cartel, they help them control the price. So uh, if you're going to own precious metals in my book, you own it physically. You stay away from the ETFs and you definitely have an, uh, a, a, an, an exposure to mining shares because I think they are uh, as good of an investment as you can find. The physical is your wealth. The mining shares are your investment and the ETFs are bad news. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, but going back to that that day in February, um, do you think it was the was it really the Wall Street um, Silver Group that had a role to play in, in what happened at that time? They are they are broadening the understanding. They are awakening the public. I think it had something to do with it. I guess if you would have told me, do you think that silver can be directed by investment demand? Normally, I would have said, don't know. It doesn't seem strong enough, but it's happening. Uh, it's happening because it's happening globally and they are having an impact. Uh, look, it's one thing to take on a hedge fund um, and who has a massive short position by a whole bunch of traders. It's another thing to take on a bullion bank in the COMEX market who's got a lot more in, you know, a lot more arrows in their quiver than does a, um, a hedge fund. I think that if anything, Wall Street Group is waking people up globally, and that will have an effect. And look, when you talk about silver, it might be the only investment or asset class that has demand, huge demand on either side of it. On one end, you have the investment demand, which is growing and expanding to levels that I've really never seen before, much more than anything any of us have ever seen in terms of investment demand. And that is having an effect from, you know, from, from all around the globe. But you also have an expansive demand in industry. And with Biden's green new agenda, moving away from fossil fuels and combustion engines, um, you know, solar panels and, and, uh, and, and wind and, and battery for Tesla, the demand is, is really growing. And one of the things where people I don't think are focusing enough on demand on the industrial side is the Chinese Belt Road and Rail Initiative. This is the largest infrastructure project in human history right now that is connecting 65% of human population between Asia and Africa. And it's not just through maritime channels and bridges and roads, it's technology that is connecting digitally. And uh, that in and of itself has a massive implication for silver, which you know, is running continual deficits in, in mine supply. Last year was over 300 million ounces. So you have, a, you have an asset class that's found in nature in a form called epithermal, very close to the surface. Big deposits are gone and they've been gone for years. You have global mine supply right now running at two to 300 million ounces short every year over the last few years in terms of supply versus demand. And you have what's coming out of the ground globally, according to Keith Newmeyer, my friend who runs First Majestic Silver, eight to one globally. It's coming out of the ground at an eight to one ratio, yet it's being sold at nearly 70 to one. And so when you talk about an asset that not only has demand from an industrial side, but from an investment side, and also a Federal Reserve that is hell bent on uh, trying to print their way out of this problem while capping nominal interest rates, making real interest rates decidingly negative, you could not have a better environment for an, an investment than, than just about anything on every single level, whether it be monetarily, whether it be industrially, or whether it be just what's going on in the state of affairs with the currency and the economy. Silver, to me, is the buying opportunity of a generation. And I say that with 100% sincerity and objectivity. And um, so I, I, I think that these pullbacks that we're seeing as counterintuitive as they are, um, should be not viewed nothing other than a subsidy and an opportunity to add to people's position. It's a gift because the prices are not justified by the level of demand. Yeah, I agree. agree with you there again. Um, but, you know, I mean, uh, I'll be very honest that one thing that's always been on my mind is with the, the Wall Street uh, Silver Group. Um, 
they're bringing in unawareness. They're bringing in more people who are starting to buy silver. But the the situation really is when it comes to comics, let's say they deal in thousand ounce LBMA bars. Wall Street Reddit, most of us guys, you know, we're dealing in one ounce coins, maybe hundred ounce bars. So, you know, I'm kind of wondering if, if maybe the movement in some way it helped, but it actually hurt the little guy, the average Joe, where, uh, where supply became less, demand became more, and uh, premiums and the cost of silver actually went up. Arguably, you're right. Um, it probably did. I guess, I guess I would answer that by saying little guys late to the dance and they got to dance with whatever girls across the room from them. And uh, I mean, that's just the way that it goes in that, you know, we've been talking about this for a very long time for 31 years and <laughs> better early than late, I guess. But um, I think that this awakening, this realization in an environment that can't, you know, remember, the the amount of gold and silver out there it's a tiny little market and as people remember one half of one percent and if if we start growing to one percent to one and a half percent to two percent you're talking a doubling a tripling a quadrupling of demand in an industry that for 40 years has not prepared for it and so when you talk about high premiums um yeah they're as high as i've ever seen and, and that's, that is indicative of, of demand. And now you're beginning to see it globally. You know, there's rumors of the Perth Mint uh, not being able to deliver. There's rumors of the UK Mint not being able to deliver. You're seeing metal taken off all of the exchanges. You're seeing a concerted effort to gather metal and, uh, and to take possession of it. What's going on in the COMEX, what's going on in India, what's going on in the Shanghai Gold Exchange, the LBMA, the backdooring of the ETFs, all of them have one thing in common, and that is metal being pulled away by the most sophisticated money in the world. And as it trickles down into the one ounce arena, yeah, you have an expansion of, of interest, but you also have not just by the little guy, but by the big guy too. And the big guy is draining the, the shelves from the top on down, whether it be thousand ounce bars on Comex or, or, uh, or just going in and making large purchases from, from dealers around the globe. It's becoming harder and harder to get, and the, the et end result is much higher premiums that would most certainly uh, affect the little guy. And, um, and that's why I say on these, these dips, buy the dips. Don't chase the rips. Buy the dips. And this is a dip. And uh, if you can buy one or two or three ounces and put it away, do it. Um, but I don't think you're going to see premiums come down anytime soon, Patrick, because there's just not enough to go around. And what Wall Street is doing is waking people up one by one by one by one. And that's how you beat the COMEX. That's how you win. You don't beat the COMEX by trying to create a run on it because they'll change the rules. They will first, they'll jack up margin requirements, and then they will just cash settle. They'll force majeure. They'll change the rules the way that they did. Oh, they'll just make it illegal to go long like they did on the Hunt Brothers. They will change the rules. The way that you win, the way that we all win, is by taking one ounce off at a time in coin and bar form so that there's nothing left anywhere. And that will have an effect as it spills over under the COMEX. It will wake people up. It will wake other hedge funds up that, hey, you know, they'll smell blood in the water. This is an asset class that has so many bullish um, uh, traits to it, and there's nothing to be found, something's not right. And that's something that is not right. Again, ask yourself, in the midst of that kind of craziness, where everyone's shutting down, more money's going into the, to the ETFs than ever before. Who in their mind would dump that kind of amount of silver at, in between the markets, close in London and open in New York? guaranteed to smash the price by over three bucks and, and offer the worst possible execution in that environment. Imagine it's Bitcoin and the largest Bitcoin holder that there is, if at 50,000, he says, or she says, I need to take some profit, dump it all. No, that's not what they would do. They would slowly sell, you know, sell a million worth here, wait a few hours, sell another million, wait a few hours, sell another million, wait a day, sell 10 million. You don't dump it all. You don't dump $1.5 billion worth at the open. 
to guarantee the worst possible execution. And, and what I'm saying is this is all being managed. Perception of reality is big. It's called MOPE, Management of Perception Economics. They are trying to manage the perception, create a perception of reality. They don't want to be overrun and they do not want to let the price of gold and silver fly yet. The biggest money in the world is, is making a concerted effort, I believe, at cornering the physical supply. And whether it be JP Morgan, who has over a billion ounces of silver and over 30 million ounces of gold, uh, or whether it be the sovereign wealth funds who are continually pulling metal off of the exchanges, like we've seen here again in the March delivery month, 90 million ounces backdoored out of SLV, 50 to 55 million ounces taken off of COMEX, huge amount of silver taken off of the London Metals Exchange in exchange for physical. You're talking massive amounts of silver when last year, the COMEX delivered over 300 million ounces, which was a record year, almost a decade worth of deliveries. Who's taking the deliveries? It's a third group of reportables called the others that really have never been on the, the uh, radar before because the COMEX market's never been a delivery mechanism. And now all of a sudden it is. So you see the most well-funded, sophisticated investors on the planet front running this decision, and they are taking massive amounts off of COMEX. And I'll tell you one thing that I find really interesting right now is that for the first time, now last year, one of the things Chris Marcus and I would talk about a lot is, well, yes, there's a lot of deliveries on COMEX, but it's not leaving the building. It is now. All of a sudden, we're seeing stuff leave the building. So all of these... Could this be Tesla? Could this be Panasonic? Could this be Apple? Could it be Samsung? Have they bought it last year and let it just sit in the warehouse and now they're getting freaked out too and say, give it to me, let's put it in our warehouse. Uh, let's have it for industry. And then it starts to feed on one another as Apple buys it, maybe Tesla needs to get it, maybe Panasonic needs to get it, maybe Samsung, oh boy, better hurry up. And, and then, and then the, the investment side says, well, boy, it's disappearing. We got to get some premiums start to go up in other words, all of this demand is creating a problem with supply and yet the smashing of the price, the maintaining of the price through actions like we saw at the beginning of February is how they're doing it. It is creating distortions. Those distortions in price, like to your point, they're affecting the little guy and they'll continue to do so. I don't see, um, I don't see that changing anytime soon. Quite frankly, I see it accentuating because the sophisticated investor sees that this is a buying opportunity. The little guy is waking up to it too. And remember the one half of 1%, we're moving closer to the two to two and a half percent average. How about we get to the 8% that we saw in 1980? At 8%, that's a 16 fold increase in demand to anything this global industry has seen for 40 years. So you tell me, does it get better anytime soon? I'll tell you this, in order for me to buy product from the Sovereign Mints lately, and I've been ahead of this for the last year, I need to, to buy way in advance. We just made a very large purchase from the Perth Mint, ironically, um, of 75,000 ounces of silver kangaroos. We did this in February, had to pay three months out for April delivery at the highest premiums I've ever paid in my career, ever. Can't hedge those premiums either. So when we talk about the little guy, what I think these sovereign mints are doing, by the way, is ignoring the little guy in favor of their large North American wholesale business. And uh, it's only going to get worse. People are going to pay high premiums. They're going to have delivery delays uh, because as we expand towards more and more people waking up to owning precious metals, just a little bit, uh, it's going to have major ramifications on global supply. And we're beginning to see that. Yeah, you um, that that was really my my next question. Where, what is it going to take for us to see premiums return to to normal? I mean, even if uh, let's say the spot price goes down, we're looking at higher oil costs, which means higher shipping costs. Um, you know, we're even still looking at uh, we need the mines to be back on fully. Uh, the supply chains need to be moving about the world globally back to to full speed. And I mean, there are just so many more little pieces to the puzzle in order to get the premiums to come back down. And I mean, that, that was really my question where will we ever see it or maybe not ever see it, but what will it take for these premiums to, to come back down? Less demand. I mean, premium is a function of supply and demand and the mints can't keep up with it. They just, they can't keep up with the global demand. And as we continue to see demand in a, in an environment where currencies are being eviscerated, um, People are waking up. Bitcoin is a good example of, of that. People are waking up to 
uh, what the central banks have been doing to the currencies. And a little of that is spilling over into hard assets. Um, I don't know if we will see them come back to, down anytime soon. And I'm not willing to, to gamble on our business to see if that's the case. And what I mean by that is that, like I said, with the Perth Mint, I had to pay higher premiums than I ever have in 31 years and pay them three months in advance. Now the 75,000 ounces, I hedged that. So if the price of the 75,000 that I committed to right here drops and I've already paid for it, what I sold short on Comex moves up. My, my physical metal supply is hedged, but the premium north of, let's say north of three or $4 an ounce on 75,000 ounces, I got over a quarter million bucks in there in, in premium that is unhedgeable. And so when you talk about, you know, will the premiums go down? I don't know. I'm, I'm betting for at least over the next three months that they're not even going to come close to going back down. And quite frankly, as things get more and more intense and, and people start to realize more and more that we're going to have problems with the currency when you talk about inflation uh, and, and the amount of money creation that we've seen and what potentially could happen in fighting a global deflationary trend with the printing press and, and low interest rates, need that the awakening will only accentuate those premiums, make them go higher. So do they come back down? I don't know. I'm one of only 27 United States Mint authorized resellers on the planet. And I'll tell you, I've never seen premiums as high on, on silver eagles ever, gold eagles ever, gold buffaloes ever. And when you see a mint that the second week in January uh, stops really sending out gold eagles and buffaloes because they're out of supply, that's something you see in November. You don't see that two weeks into the new year. The demand is off the charts and, and the mints are not keeping up with supply. That will result in higher premiums. Because if you're one of the primary distributors out there that is buying all of these uh, allocations from the mints, not getting very much in allocations, but having demand from every corner of the globe, at what point do you start saying, I don't know what the next shipment looks like. We need to get higher prices here because we don't know if we're going to continue to get supply. And the reason, Patrick, they say there's no bull market like a gold bull market is because it's, it's identified by concern and fear. And the higher the price goes or the crazier the world gets, either one or both, strengthens people's grip on the metal. They don't sell. So the secondary market is void of, of product. And what you then have is massive demand, no secondary market product, and mints that are the model of inefficiency. Premiums are bound to go up. Until that changes, it won't. Okay. And, you know, we've, we've been seeing the, the reports on social media where uh, Perth Mint is, has a bit of issues. Uh, Royal Mint UK, over in UK, has a bit of issues. And we saw where US Mint actually canceled some, some orders or something like that. And, but when it came to the US Mint, my, my take on it was, you know, this was probably just a personal order where somebody ordered a limited edition coin or something yes. like that. So I just wanted to, to get your opinion on that since you are one of the, the authorized dealers with the US Mint. I don't believe it to be wholesale. It, it is, you know, the difference between what someone can do with the U.S. Mint and with us, it's different. So people can go to usmint.gov and buy proof coins and, and fancy schmancy coins that, you know, are colored or, um, you know, issued directly by the Mint. And so the difference between a proof coin and a commercial strike, just for your listeners out there, a commercial strike is what us uh, dealers receive and they come in tubes of 20 and boxes of 500 or whatever. Uh, but when you talk the difference between proof and commercial, it's the same piece of gold or silver. It's called a planchet. It's a blank disc of gold or silver for commercial strike. They stamp it once they put it in tubes, they put it in boxes and they send it out to dealers like me. Uh, you can't buy those as a, an investor directly from the mint. You have to buy them through their network of suppliers. A proof coin, however, you can buy directly from the mint. And they'll take that same planchet. First, they'll polish it under an industrial buffer so you can see your, your shine and your reflection in it. And then they'll stamp it three times for greater definition and put it in a fancy box and sell it for double or triple its melt value, call it a collectible. That is what I believe something that that person ordered and they crossed his name out. And I think that is what they're talking about. It's the fancy schmancy coins that for whatever reason got canceled or there wasn't enough demand for that coin. So they stopped it. Uh, I will say that the U.S. Mint has been somewhat inefficient. We haven't been able to get the supply that we want. And you can see by 
Silver Eagle selling at 10 bucks an ounce over the price of silver. Well, that's insane. Um, and I'm the first one to admit it. It's, it's craziness. But um, I don't think that the U.S. Mint is defaulting. I just think that on some of their specialty products, they decided to go a different direction. Why do you say that the reclassification of gold as the only other tier one asset in the banking world is the most game changing watershed and groundbreaking event of your 30 year career? Well, and there's been a little bit of um, there's been a little bit of, of questioning of that exact phrase. Uh, and it appears that, you know, the IMF has not done a great job in labeling things and uh, Rob Keens has done a wonderful job in undercovering this, undercovering this. And so let's take out the word asset and replace it with um, reserve. It's a tier one reserve. It's been levied to uh, a standard as good as cash, as, as a tier one, as high of a tier as you can possibly get. It's a tier one reserve. Okay. And so they're really the tier, the term tier one asset has been is a little bit off. It's a tier one reserve, but look at it this way. It is as good as cash. If we go back and look at the linear progression, it started in 2017, Patrick, with the German Bundesbank asking for their metal to be sent home. And uh, that came out of nowhere. Uh, after all of the central banks were net sellers of gold to that point, uh, up until through 2017, the Western central banks were by and large net sellers of gold. The only ones that were buying it were Russia, uh, India, and China. The rest of the world were net sellers of gold. In 2018, after the Bundesbank requested and repatriated their gold back from the New York Fed, we saw the Bank of Austria, the Bank of Hungary, the Bank of Turkey, the Bank of Poland, the Dutch National Bank, on and on and on. All of these commercial banks said, give me my gold back. And we want it back from the New York Fed and from the Bank of England. Okay, fine. The next year, 2019, oh, by the way, in 2018, those same central banks who were net sellers of gold out of nowhere bought more gold as a group than they did in the previous 60 years combined. 2019 gold gets le levied, raised to a tier one reserve class, which is the highest level of reserve on par with cash. So they front run this decision by accumulating it for almost a year and a half, voraciously from being net sellers to massive buyers. They levy and reclassify it as good as cash. Uh, and then in 2020, we see uh, the IMF call for a new Bretton Woods, which is a new dollar standard. Uh, and then we see the rise of this group called the Others, this, this Others group on COMEX, who has been pulling metal off month after month after month in levels that we would typically see in a year. They're taking off in a month. So why is it the biggest event of my career? Because the big guy always defines the market before the little guy even knows what's going on. And it's the the the, the most sophisticated, well-funded, well-informed investors in the world are telling you what they believe gold to be. It's as good as cash. And before they told us it's as good as cash in April of 2019, as part of the Basel III agreement, they, they bought the crap out of it and all repatriated it away from the Fed and the Bank of England. They're holding it. They're buying it. Then they reclassify it. And then on the private side, directly after the hedge funds and the sovereign wealth funds that are the others, they're buying it. They're taking it back. And now they're pulling it off of the exchanges. Do you see the linear progression? You have the most well-funded, well-informed, sophisticated investors on the planet that since 2017 have been taking possession of metal after it has been reclassified as a tier one reserve, which is as high as it gets in terms of valuation. So uh, I think that they're front running the game as they always do. The big guy always is ahead of the rest of us because they're the ones that know the rules before the rest of us realize what the rule changes are, are really are. And then when you see the great reset coming by the, the world monetary organization, what does that mean? Are these people preparing for a great reset? Do they know what's coming next? Maybe they do, but uh, that that's why I believe it to be so significant because People of that level of sophistication, wealth, and knowledge do not make decisions like reclassifying gold for the first time in 70 plus years as a tier one reserve just for the crap of it. They do it because something, something bigger portrays for gold. And if I had to guess what that would be, it is destruction of fiat currency. It is a great reset into a digital uh, realm, uh, a new Fed coin that will have a tether some sort of a tether, something has to have a tether to gold. 
because we will not drink the same Kool-Aid again. And that's why you see the rise of cryptocurrencies. People are beginning to mistrust, distrust fiat currency, and rightfully so. And so if you want to have some semblance of, of respectability and honor, you tether it to gold, even if it's not redeemable, even if it's only 10% of a new Fed coin, tethered to gold with its custody denoted on a distributed ledger, great. Uh, now you'll have people say, okay, well, fine. They're not going to run us down the same inflationary path that every other uh, world reserve currency prior to it has. So if I had to guess the reclassification, the pulling back, the taking away from the, the centers and taking possession, the, the big money, pulling it off of COMEX, pulling it out of the ETFs, pulling it off of Shanghai, pulling it off of the LBMA, these are all indicative of the big money repositioning ahead of what's coming this great reset and doing so before the rest of us even know what's going on. That's why it's the biggest event in my career because where there's smoke, there's fire. And people of that wealth and that power do not make moves like this in a vacuum. It portrays, I believe, for much higher gold prices moving forward. And remember, when I say gold, I mean silver too. To the beginning of time, there's a 90% correlation in movement between the two. So if gold goes to the moon, Silver may not follow uh, you know, exactly with it in terms of its uh, symmetry. It will follow, but may not be time, you know, ounce for ounce. It, it will follow because there is that 90% correlation for the last 5,000 years. So I mean that too. Yeah, all great points. You know, when, when you say the word uh, the others, uh, I can't help but to think of that, that TV show Lost where they had that mysterious group where they would call these people the others. Uh, they kind of seem like that group, but um, can't leave but it's without. True. I mean, that, that group yeah. had a feeling of being, you know, more powerful, uh, knowing what's going on. Uh, that's what it is. I mean, that's what they're called on Comex. They're called the others. It's a third <laughs> reportable group that pretty much came out of nowhere. Who are the others? Sovereign wealth funds and family offices, the wealthiest private investors in the world. And I would argue, if you're at that level, do you know the policymakers? Are are you a policymaker wearing your you know, your, your at home shirt. Uh, and I, you know, when you're, when you're swinging in those circles, uh, you probably know the people making rules. And, you know, if, if you were my buddy and I were a policymaker, I may call you up and say, Patrick, you probably want to buy some gold and silver and maybe go take a few contracts off of Comex. Wink, wink. I mean, that's what they're doing. I mean, you know, they all swing in the same circle. So, you don't see this kind of effort to do something that's never happened before. COMEX was never a delivery mechanism, Patrick. It was used to hedge and risk and offset risk and exposure. And now all of a sudden in 2020, it turns into the delivery mechanism massively, where, a where as much is taken off in a month as we see in a year. Last year, a decade's worth of metal was taken off in both gold and silver. Do you think these people know something we don't? Do you think they're being told by their buddies, hey, this is what you should probably do? Could it be them wearing a different hat? I don't know. I just know that it's very unusual. And you have the most well-funded, well-informed, sophisticated traders on the globe since 2017 showing this to be true. And uh, I don't think it's going to stop until, until there's nothing left to be taken off of the exchanges, until COMEX goes force majeure, until the whole thing blows up. Yeah, I love the way you connected the dots and just pretty much painted the, the picture, a clear picture for us to, to see. Um, I gotta ask you, which, which do you favor more, gold or silver? Uh, ultimately, I'm a gold bug. I think right now silver is the greatest pathway into getting more gold. Period. Um, silver is a very unique asset, and I've been buying more silver than gold over the last year. I think at a ratio, anytime you're at a ratio anywhere near seventy to one, you should be in silver. And when you realize, when Keith Newmeyer tells me publicly on an interview he and I did that globally what's coming out of the ground is eight to one, yet it's priced at near 70 to one. It's an opportunity of a generation. Ultimately, I see the price going much higher in silver, which as the ratio between gold and silver narrows, gives you the ability to switch into gold at, you know, in other words, if you buy silver at 70 to one nearly and switch into gold at 20 to one, 25 to one, you know, that's a, a three or four fold increase in the amount of gold you could otherwise buy today. I think that's why silver is a pathway into more gold, but uh, it, it's, it's a toss up. I mean, I love silver. I do. The only issue is that 
my wife could put a hundred grand worth of gold in her purse and we could go for a five mile walk and she wouldn't even have a sore shoulder. Right. And, but a hundred grand worth of, of silver is going to weigh 250 pounds. We'd both be carrying wheelbarrows for that five mile walk. So that's really the difference. The logistics of silver make it more challenging to accumulate large amounts, but you know, it's a, it's a better play. I truly believe it's as good of a play period as anyone could ever, ever ask for in every single metric that we've talked about right now, I prefer silver. Ultimately, I think we want to have more of our assets in gold, but when does ultimately take hold? I don't know. Silver is the opportunity of a generation though. And I do mean that. With all that you've, you've said, um, do you think we're close to that end game? I would have thought we'd been at the end game a long time ago. The one thing that has always amazed me. And when I look back over 31 years, most of the stuff that we said was going to happen has, um, because we base our, our hypothesis upon economics, mathematics, with a sprinkling of old school logic. And it comes true. You can't run from math, but never when we think it will, never how we think it will, and usually way later than we think it will. I remember wondering if gold would ever break through 400, ever. I remember if silver would ever break through $10, ever. And it did. And, and you know, I think we will see things continue to move in this direction. Uh, but never that we think it will and never when we think it will and never how we think it will. And what 2020 showed me is that the impossible can happen. Anything that we would think will never happen can. And that's why you just prepare uh, for the inevitable. Um, so I don't know what the catalyst is. I don't know what breaks the system. I don't know how it all plays out, but ultimately I think that we will see much, much higher prices in gold and silver, ultimately. But let's just be honest, we're dealing in a market that is being held back. But Patrick, the only way you can successfully manipulate a market over an extended period of time is to push it in the direction that it is going. What is different now is that not only do you have a growing and expansive industrial demand in silver, you have a, a worldwide awakening in investment demand. And what started as a minute part of the public, segment of the public buying gold and silver is expanding. And you know what, just maybe this expansion in and of itself, the investment demand globally will be enough to, uh, to, to move the needle. And once that needle starts to move and then you start to get the snowball effect of all the industrials rushing to get metal to secure their production and the investors realizing this is a, a once in a lifetime opportunity and they're pitted against one another in both gold and silver, I think you'll see prices go to where we all think they will. But may not happen the way that we've all drawn it up in our mind. Ultimately, it will. Put it away, put it in your safe, buy on the dips and be glad that you've been able to accumulate it while it's still here. Uh, because price is a tool of misdirection. The price that we see right now is in nowhere near reflective of the demand that we're seeing globally, whether it be down here at the one ounce level or all the way up there on the COMEX at the thousand ounce bar level and everywhere in between. Okay, Andy Sheckman, before we wrap up, can you let our viewers know more about Miles Franklin and how they can benefit from your company's services? Absolutely. They can always reach us at info at Miles Franklin, where for the past 13 months here in the United States, we've been able to guarantee pretty darn close to the lowest price in the industry. As I mentioned, we are old school. At this point, even though we're building a new website that will offer a limited ability to purchase online and show prices, uh, we have to, people have to contact us, whether it be by info at Miles Franklin or on our main line at 1-800-822-8080. Our prices will be, for the most part, unbeatable in the industry. But what really differentiates Miles Franklin on top of our reputation, never a customer complaint, uh, A-plus rating, worldwide exclusives with Brinks, um, all of the things that, you know, U.S. Mint representative, that, that makes us who we are, things that make us, the state of Minnesota doesn't care. State of Minnesota, where our corporate office is located, is the only state in the United States that mandates uh, licensing and bonding in a federally non-regulated industry. And so we're licensed, we're bonded, we're the safest company in North America to work with. Because of that, almost 99% of my peers in the industry will not do business in Minnesota. They won't. They refuse. They boycotted it, put, took it off of their, their mail to states because they would have to be subservient to the Commissioner of Commerce here in Minnesota the way we are licensing annually, background checks of every employee annually and principal, myself included, 
and a surety bond that backs all of our business, which is the big one. Licensing, bonding, continuing education, all of this stuff makes working with us the safest transaction in North America. Our track record and our reputation backs that up. That's how they get a hold of us. Send us an email, give us a phone call, give us an opportunity. It's not as convenient as the click websites, but it's safer. And as is our reputation, we'll put an exclamation point behind that as does the state of Minnesota. I really do appreciate the opportunity to be here with you and, uh, and to chat with you today, Patrick. You're one of my favorite people in this industry. Keep doing what you're doing. You're a, you're a bright light in the industry that uh, needs people like you. And I uh, hope to come back and chat with you again sometime real soon. Andy Shekman, we thank you for those comments and, and the time you've given. And um, we do wish you and your family, as well as the Miles Franklin family, all the best. And we thank you for all you do as well. Hope we can do it again soon. Thank you. Look forward to it. Stay well. You too. Stay well, Andy. That was Andy Sheckman, president and CEO of Miles Franklin Precious Metals Investments, sharing with us his views about precious metals. To find out more about Miles Franklin, please visit their website, milesfranklin.com. If you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe to the SBTV channel to be updated on new content. And do also check out the SBTV podcast on iTunes and Spotify.